Welcome, guys. Thanks for being here uh, tonight. As Pastor Lyle said, my name is Matt. Um, I love this church. I love being a part of it. Uh, tonight has already started off being a good night, right? Worship was awesome. Uh, I don't know about you, but I was like, let's just scrap the message. I'd have been okay with that. Uh, and let's just worship. So it was good. Keaton does a phenomenal job. It is, it's incredible. I love it. Love it so much. My Green Bay Packers won today, so that's exceptionally well. Also, Robert's Ravens lost, so let's celebrate that. Yeah! Good. It's good. Just starting off to be a good day together. I'm jacked up on coffee, so we've seen how that goes in the past. Um, kind of how my nights go, so I work overnights. I work, my Friday night is basically Saturday night into Sunday morning, so I got off at 7 o'clock this morning. I went home and slept for like two and a half hours. I've drank like a pot and a half of coffee, and whew, here we are ready to go. So by the time this is all done with, right, and I get home with my family and everything, I'm going to be like <laughs> asleep, because that's generally how my Sundays go. It's, it's really fun times. You should hang out with us a lot more, so it's going to be good. So tonight... Uh, tonight's going to be good. So tonight, the message that I, that God's put on my heart, I believe is, is challenging for us. Uh, I'm not, I would say I'm not the best person when it comes to challenging. I do really good at encouraging. I'm like, ah, you're the best. Even if the back of my mind, I'm like, that could have been better, but I'm like, you're the best, right? I mean, you did an excellent job. I'm good at that. The challenging part, uh, is a little challenging for me at times. So I'm excited about the message tonight. A couple weeks ago, uh, Pastor Lila was talking about running the race um, here at Elements Church. Some of the language that we use uh, is rest and work, right? How many know what I'm talking about? Raise your hand if you're like, re- you've heard the word rest before, right? Okay, I'm just trying to get everybody involved. Have we all heard of work? I know this is Summit County, but I mean, we've heard of work. Okay, so, so Lila talked about work, right? We, we have spent, I think, Honestly, the past year, focusing a lot on rest because rest is important. If you can put up our, the first slide, here we go. So we call this is the semicircle, right? We've got this pendulum that swings between rest and work. Rest is our time that we are abiding. We're spending in the presence of God, right? It's, it's where we're praying. It's where we're reading scripture. We're listening to worship songs. We're coming to Sunday night services. We're spending time in the presence of God. And then on the opposite side of that, we have work, right? So as we're growing, as we're abiding in that relationship, developing that relationship with Christ, out of that comes the strength for us to work. We work from rest, not rest from work, which is something I think that as Americans we do well, right? I mean, we, we work hard, we, we work too much, we become workaholics, and then we're exhausted, we're wiped out, and so that's when we generally crash. That's where we find rest. But how we're supposed to do things is we're supposed to work out of rest, out of that time spent growing in our relationship with God, receiving the strength we need to do the things that we're supposed to do. And so tonight, I don't want to just focus on the idea of work, but I want to look at what our work ethic is like. So I know what you're thinking. You're like, all this talk about working is exhausting, right? And it's like, I just want to go home and rest because I'm tired of hearing about working so much. I just got done working, right? But Hang, hang in there with me. It's going to be a good time tonight. Um, we're going to start off with a little humor. It's kind of how I like to do things, right? I like to bring a little laughter, a little comic relief at the beginning, and then bam, I hit you with a hammer. Or, well, that sounds violent, so I'm not going to do that. But, but then we, you know, we bring the, the meat of things. So we're going to start out this idea of work ethic. So I, I found some memes. I was inspired by Asa. Find some memes. So I love this one. I love Christmas, right? So this is perfect. Coworkers are like Christmas lights. They all hang together, but half of them don't work, right? And the other half aren't so bright. It's a good one. I like that one. So the next one we have is this is a helpful tip. If you ever get caught sleeping at work, just slowly raise your head and say, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Ugh, that's a good one right there. That's, you need to put that one just like in your back pocket, right, for that day that, that you're like, man, I'm exhausted. And they come in there like, what are you doing? You're like, in Jesus' name, amen. I was just praying, man. It's my religious rights that I have to pray to Jesus. 
I got a video clip here. How many have seen the movie uh, Office Space? I <laughs> love this movie. It's so, so good. Office Space is the epitome of, like, what work ethic is in America. So let's watch this clip real quick. This is my associate, Bob Porter. Hi, Bob. Bob? Pretty much I'd go ahead and grab a seat and join us for a minute or two. You see, what we're actually trying to do here is we're just, we're trying to get a feel for how people spend their day at work. So if you would, would you walk us through a typical day for you? Yeah. Great. Well, I generally come in at least 15 minutes late. Uh, I use the side door. That way Lumber can't see me. <laughs> and uh, after that, I just sort of space out for about an hour. Tell but, him uh, space out? Yeah. I just stare at my desk. But it looks like I'm working. I do that for uh, probably another hour after lunch, too. I'd say in a given week, I probably only do about 15 minutes of real, actual work. Uh, Peter, would you be a good sport and indulge us and just tell us a little more? Oh, yeah. Let me tell you something about TPS reports. TPS uh, reports. That's what we're going to talk about tonight is TPS reports. It's going to be exciting and thrilling and I think for us, the idea of working and work ethic and working hard, sometimes we get it confused, right? We think of our work ethic as in how many hours I put in at work, right? Or, or we, we like to label it according to whatever our position or job title might be, but it's not about those things. It's not about how much money we make or the benefits that we receive. Our work ethic is about the quality of work that we do, right? It's about what we bring to the table when we show up to work. It's not just about our jobs at, you know, Rocky Mountain Coffee Roasters, right? What we do, you know, making really good coffee. It's not about, you know, helping people out at Wells Fargo, although those are great. It's about what we're doing when we're there. It's the quality that we bring to the table. Well, it's the same when it comes to the work God has called us to do, right? You're like, well, I don't... I mean, God's not called me to be a preacher or a missionary or anything, so I'm not, not sure what you're talking about there. Well, God called us to be an example as believers to our world, right? We have a work ethic that's involved in that, and it comes even down to what our relationship with God is like. What kind of work do we put into that? What kind of effort, what kind of quality of time am I spending with God? And so tonight we're going to look at a story uh, it's in Jeremiah chapter 36, so if you have your Bible, your phone, and can flip to your app or page, it's on page number 831 in your Bible, if you have your Bibles with us. It's on the third page of your uh, screen on your phone. Anyway, so we're going to have, there's going to be a little bit of reading here. I want to say a little bit for like the next hour and a half. I'm just going to be reading. So I'm going to take a drink of water for this. We're going to read through this story here in Jeremiah, about Jeremiah, but we're not looking at Jeremiah when we look at this idea of work ethic, right? We're going to be looking at his, his buddy, uh, Baruch, who is the person that we're going to learn things from tonight. So we're going to start verse 1, chapter 36, says, The message of the Lord came to Jeremiah. This was during the fourth year that uh, Jehoiakim... So I'm bitchering that. Uh, son of Josiah was king of Judah. This was the message from the Lord. Verse 2, Jeremiah, get a scroll and write on it all the messages that I have spoken to you. I have spoken to you about the nation of Israel and Judah and all the other nations. Write all the words that I have spoken to you from, that, from the time that Josiah was king until now. Maybe the people of Judah will hear what I am planning to do to them, listen to that, to do to them, not for them, not with them, to do to them. Why? Because these people were not following God. They were not listening to him. They were not doing what was right. He's like, so God says, you know, the things that I'm going to do to them and will stop doing bad things, if they do that, I will forgive them of their terrible sins that they have committed. So Jeremiah called a man named Baruch, son of Nira. Jeremiah spoke the message of the Lord he had given him. While he spoke, Baruch wrote the message 
on the scroll. This is what this guy did. He wrote the message down. Then Jeremiah said to Baruch, I cannot go to the Lord's temple. I'm not allowed to go there. So I want you to go to the temple of the Lord. Go there on the day of fasting and read to the people from the scroll. Read to the people the message from the Lord that you wrote on the scroll as I spoke them to you. Read them to all the people of Judah who came into Jerusalem from the towns where they live. Perhaps they will ask the Lord to help them. Perhaps each person will stop doing bad things. The Lord has announced that he is very angry with them. So Baruch, son of Nera, did everything Jeremiah the prophet told him to do. Baruch read aloud the scroll that the Lord or that had the Lord's message written on it. He read it in the Lord's temple. Verse 9. Then in the ninth month of the fifth year of Jehoiakim, when he was king, this is, this is the month of December, right, for, the, for this time period, uh, a fast was announced. And all those who lived in the city of Jerusalem and everyone who had come into Jerusalem from the towns of Judah were supposed to fast before the Lord. At that time, Baruch read the scroll that contained Jeremiah's words. See, this, they were smart about this, right? They didn't just run out and, oh, there's a few people over here. I'm going to go and read this to them. They waited. There's this time of fasting. Everybody had funneled into the town. So there was this large group of people in this one space. And that's when God said, this is when I want you to read the message I've given to Jeremiah that you have written down onto the scroll. And then I lost my place. Well, that's not in Scripture. That's just me, but it's okay. So it says that Baruch read the scroll that contained Jeremiah's words. He read the scroll in the temple of the Lord to all the people who were there. Baruch was in the room of the entrance of the new gate to the temple. Uh, Jemariah, the son of Sephin. Um, where am I at? Here we go. Jemariah was a scribe. He was a scribe in the temple. All right, verse 11. Let's get back on track here, Matt. A man that, I know it's a lot, right? So thanks for being patient with me. A man named uh, Micaiah heard all the messages from the Lord that Barak read from the scroll. scroll. Uh, Micaiah was the son of Jemariah and uh, the son of, we'll just skip on. When, when, uh, when Mick, we're just going to call him Mick, heard the message from the scroll, he went down to the secretary's room in the king's palace all the royal officers were sitting there in the king's palace. So Mick told them everything that he had heard Baruch read from the scroll. Then all the officials sent a man named uh, Jehudi. I wish these people, I wish it was like Bob and Frank, Jill, right? It's much easier for us Americans. Sent a man named Jehudi to Baruch. Jehudi was, see, here we go again, was the son of uh, Nathani, the son of Shilamiah. Shilamiah was the son of Cushi. Cushi was like this teddy bear guy, right, that everybody just loved to hang out with. That's what I think. So Jehudi said to Baruch, says, bring the scroll that you read from and come with me. So it's Baruch, he took this scroll. We're going to, we're, we're just going to, we're going to shorten this down. What he does, there's... I've got like seven more pages of scripture and half the words I can't even pronounce. It's like hooked on phonics did not work for me. Um, so here's in a nutshell, right? So he reads a scroll. Jehudi then takes this scroll and goes to King Jehoiakim, right? And he reads it to him. Now the king... Um, doesn't care what is on the, the scrolls, right? I mean, he, he's done with this. He doesn't want to hear this stuff. It's just noise to him. And so as Jehudi's trying to read from the scroll, which contains the message from God, right? The king will take, he took part of that, and he would, it says that he cut it up, he tore it up, and he threw it into a fire. It was wintertime. It says that he was in the place of the palace where they went to for winter. Apparently, the whole place wasn't insulated. I don't know. Right? So he's got a fire, he's tearing it up, he burns the entire scroll is what it comes down to in the end. Right? And so obviously this doesn't please God. Right? These people are in sin, God is giving a word to them, he wants them to 
change their ways, and the king just tries to destroy the word of God completely. And so in it, God's like, well, that's not going to happen since I'm God, right? I'm the king of kings, and I can, I'm the one that's in charge here. So he goes back to Jeremiah. He tells him again, let's do this over again. Take two on this. So Jeremiah goes back to Baruch, and he says, we're going to do this over again, get another scroll. We're going to write it all down. And in it, even this time in it, basically the king God says the king is going to die. He's not going to be buried with the other kings. That his, his line is not going to sit on the throne of David. And in the end of it all, Baruch does what he's told. He writes down the message again. Because Baruch is, he's a friend of Jeremiah's, right? He's a co-worker. He's his scribe. This is, this is what he does for the prophet Jeremiah. And while he might be second chair to Jeremiah, Baruch's job, what he did, was very important. It was key to this story. And I believe that there's several things that we can learn from this out of what he did. Keep track of time. All right, 650. Three more hours. Let's go. All right, so we're going to look at a couple things tonight that I think that we can apply to our lives when it comes to our work ethic. Looking at Baruch, looking at this story and what we can learn from him, I think the first thing is this, that, that when it comes to our work ethic, it requires that we are committed to our task. Baruch's job was simple. If we just want to look at it from, from, for what it is, there was no elaborate plan to it. If we trim everything away and just get down to what the nuts and bolts of, of his task he was working essentially as the personal secretary for Jeremiah. That's what he was doing. Jeremiah had been given a message from God, and Jeremiah was to tell Baruch what it was, and his job was to write it down on a scroll. And since Jeremiah couldn't go into the temple and couldn't read this to the people that were there, Baruch was the guy that stepped in for him. He was to write this down, the message. He was to take this before the king's officials and read it to them. It was simple, yet it was very dangerous for that time. The king had already made his mind up. He didn't want to hear what God was saying. He didn't want to listen to the words of God. And so as, as the story went on, as Jehudi was reading this, like I said, the king literally tore this out of his hands, tore it up, burnt it in front of all these people because he didn't want anything to do with the message of God. The king was, I believe, trying to completely destroy this, to eliminate this from the face of the earth so that he didn't have to hear it, he didn't have to listen to it, and nobody else would. In the stories we were reading, the 17 pages I didn't read, um, it talks about how in that, after, after all of this had been read to the king, it says that he wasn't even phased, right? It says that he didn't tear his garments, there was no, like, they weren't mourning over their sins. This is what happened in the tradition, right? God would come and he would say, you're sinning. You need to change your ways. The people, they would tear their garments, right? I mean, they had this whole tradition and the king just didn't even do it. Wasn't even phased by it because he didn't care. Yet, in spite of opposition from the king, Baruch stayed true to his task. His job wasn't to go and preach to the king. It wasn't to go and challenge the officials on their position. It wasn't for him to go in and say, you guys need to really reinforce this because this is the message of God. It wasn't any of that. His task was simply to write down the message God had given Jeremiah and then to go read it to the people in the temple. Our commitment to our task might not bring us fame and glory, guys. I work overnight. Nobody sees me, right? Which I love. I'll just as a side note, I actually enjoy that. I like the fact that they trust me to just do my job. But there's no, like, pats on the back and, hey, way to go, and that's awesome, and, and you, we couldn't make it without you. My task is simply to go in and do the work that I'm supposed to do. And then I go home. 
and then I come back and do it the next night. That's how it is. And our jobs just might be that. Our task might not be something that catches other people's attention, and that's okay. In fact, for some of us, I think just doing our job, just showing up every day and being committed to that, what we receive out of that is a paycheck and not getting fired. And that's okay, because that's what our task is. And we might not get the raise that we're hoping for or the promotion that we're after. We might not get to, to, uh, to see everything as though we have envisioned it, right? But we should still be diligent to the work that we do. Whether it be at whatever place of employment we have or whether it be just in our relationship with God and our commitment to Him and what we're doing there. Colossians 3.23 says, So no matter what your task is, work hard. Always do your best as the Lord's servant, not as man's. Right? Because we're working for God, right? We're working to see His kingdom come on this earth. We're working to see our friends and our co-workers and family members to see their lives changed. Because eternity is at stake. What we do, what our task is, is important, but we have to be committed to it. And Baruch understood this, right? He understood what his task was. That no matter the results of his actions, that he was going to be faithful to the job that he had. Because he knew that he was working for God, not for Jeremiah. Even though Jeremiah essentially was his direct supervisor, that's not who he was working for. There was a bigger purpose behind what he was doing. And he was committed to his task, and God gave him the strength to follow through. Philippians 4.13, one of my favorite scripture verses, says just that. It says, Christ is the one who gives me the strength. I need to do whatever I must do. And if we rely on God for our strength, listen, friends, we can accomplish anything. No matter how long our work day is or, or how anxious we might get, right, because we're handing out chocolate chip cookies at the employee housing and people keep shutting the door in our face or, or no matter how stressful we might uh, end up finding ourselves because we've been praying for coworkers or friends and, and instead of them coming to know Jesus, right, it's like they're going further and further down the rabbit hole away from Christ. And we can get frustrated and we can find ourselves feeling like we're at a dead end spot and that we're not moving forward and that there's no point in what we're doing. But the reality is we have a task to do. It doesn't have to be pretty. In fact, a lot of times it's messy, but it's our task and we have to be committed to it and do our due diligence. The second thing I think that we can learn that we is required of us to have a solid, healthy work ethic is that we have to be committed to our capacity. Not everyone is going to be the leader. Now, you can be a leader in what you're doing. You can be a leader of your family. You can be a leader in, in uh, decisions that are making. If you're hanging out with friends and they're all like, hey, let's go rob a bank. I don't know. And you're like, mm, well, that's not a good idea. Uh, but you can be a leader in those things. But in your job, right, in your world that lives in that, not all of us are going to be the leader. Not every director or CEO that's out there today Uh, had the ability to do the job that they do 10 years ago. And so as as I was looking at this, I'm like, well, why is that, right? Why why is it? And I think it's because essentially we don't have the capacity to do all jobs, right? We don't have the capacity to to perform all the tasks needed in every job. As I was looking at this, I started started to think about Steve Jobs, right? He's he's this famous guy who invented Apple, right? He had a co-founder. Does anybody know who the co-founder's name was of Apple? Thank you. His name was Steve, too. I mean, they were like besties, right? Steve and Steve. Wozniak. So Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak created Apple, but before all of that happened, in fact, three years prior to Apple being launched, Steve Jobs took a job with Atari as a technician. Who here knows what Atari is? 
Yeah, that's old school video games. Grew up on that stuff. How the story goes is Steve Wozniak invented Pong or designed the game Pong. Steve Jobs took it to Atari. Atari thought Steve Jobs made it and offered him a job as a technician, and he accepted it. Kind of changes your picture of who Steve Jobs is, right? And this dude's like a moocher, and he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, that was me. That was me right there, right? So then three years later, they, they, they get together. There's this other guy who I don't remember his name because he's not important, right, who helps invent or they start up Apple as a company. They go, they've got the first computer, whatever, and they're doing all their computer st- I don't know. This. Anyway, and so it's like a year after that. I mean, it's like 70, 1977 when they actually do the first mass production of Apple II, right? A personal home computer. And it goes huge, right? I mean, it's, it's this awesome thing. This computer. Way to go, Steve Jobs. Actually, Steve Wozniak designed the computer. Do you know what Steve Jobs did? He designed the case. So that's essentially, that's like taking your brand new iPhone in a nice gel case and being like, this is awesome. Steve Jobs is amazing. Look at what he made this gel case. I mean, it's essentially what at the beginning this guy did. Why? Because I believe he wasn't at the point, he didn't have the capacity to do what he ended up being, what he was famous for, what they made a movie or movies of him about. His capacity wasn't to the level where he could do those things. All he could do was make a case for a computer. That other guy who is like in the shadows was the one doing the hard work. We don't always start at the top. In fact, some of us, we might never reach the top. Some of you here might be like, I don't even want to be at the top. I don't even like knowing who is at the top, right? I don't even want none of that noise. And the reality is that might change. It will in life as we grow older, as we learn more things and everything. Our capacity expands what we're able to do, what we're able to contribute grows. But we need to be okay with the fact that that where we are now is what our capacity is. What I do at my job that I go to is what I'm capable of doing, right? There's, there's other more technical sides of it um, that if I was a real engineer, Lydia, that I would be able to understand like she does and do like she can. But I don't, right? Because I don't have that capacity. That, that's not to say that I couldn't get there. I mean, I could spend that time, and I can learn, and I can do things, and I do. But where I'm at is where I'm at, because that's what I'm capable of doing, and I need to be okay with that. I need to be fine with the work I'm doing, and I need to do a good job at it. 1 Corinthians 12, 9 through 11, it says, The Spirit gives faith to one person, and to another He gives the gifts of healing. The Spirit gives to one person the power to do miracles, to another the ability to prophesy, and to another the ability to judge what is from the Spirit and what is not. The Spirit gives one person the ability to speak in different kinds of languages, and to another the ability to interpret those languages. One Spirit, the same Spirit, all does these things. The Spirit decides what to give each one. It doesn't say he gives everybody everything, right? It's not the matrix where they just load up a new program and I learn how to do kung fu or whatever, right? Or all of a sudden, I'm like this amazing CPA because they just downloaded this stuff into my brain. My capacity is limited to what I'm able to do. And even in my spiritual life, there's a capacity, there's a limit of what I'm able to do. I love preaching. I really, really enjoy doing this. When I first started out, I was awful. Like, like, awful is probably not the right word. Because there probably isn't a word for how bad I actually was. It was was something. Like, 
Like, I would not hire me to do that job type of deal, you know? Now, it was awful, but my capacity was limited. It wasn't what it is today, right? I have grown, I have learned, I have expanded. God has, has given me a greater ability now than what I had before. But one of the problems I think that we have in America is this idea that we should start at the top. Right? We go to college, we graduate, we have this nice pretty degree that's like an eight and a half by 11 size sheet of paper that says you did all these things, you're smart now. And we're like, with that, I should be able to be the CEO of Amazon now because I have a degree. Woohoo! The reality is, though, it's like you're offered an entry level job and you feel disgusted. Right? These people don't know me. I just graduated from college where I partied and drank until I passed out and did all of these awful things. And, but now I'm ready to be this great person and run these amazing companies and everything. The reality is we don't have that capacity at that point. We might have the knowledge, right? It might be stored up in our brain. We might understand how to do things and the functions of stuff. But the reality is that the capacity to do that is not there. And just because you don't have your dream job doesn't mean that you won't have that someday. But until then, so guys, we've got to be committed to where we are in the capacity that we have now. Baruch knew this. He wasn't trying to be Jeremiah. Jeremiah had his role. He had his job to do. Baruch was the Robin to Jeremiah's Batman. He wasn't trying to drive the Batmobile. Why? Because he'd have probably crashed it. Why? Because he couldn't handle that. And that's okay. And it's okay for us to acknowledge the fact that I can't run a major corporation. Maybe someday, right? Maybe someday we'll be there but we've got to be okay with where we're at right now, and we have to thrive in that. God gave Baruch a task, and he gave him the capacity to be able to fulfill that, and he did it. And he did it with, I believe, maybe not a smile on his face, but let's say cheer in his heart, right? It was like Christmas time for that guy, even in the midst of all of the frustrating things that happened. We need to recognize that there's limits to what we can and can't do. And that's okay, because we can still thrive within those boundaries. And we can know that we can still grow, and we can improve, and we can change, and we can adapt, and our capacity can grow with us. And that's okay. So we've got to be committed to our task, and we've got to be committed to the capacity that we have. And the third thing that we see in Baruch's story here and that applies to us is we have to be committed to God. This is actually the greatest of the three. I just wanted to throw it in at the last because I was like, if I start with this, everybody will leave. They'll be like, boom, got the, got the good stuff, I'm out, right? Got that nugget, gone. That was the idea of like, if we move the stage to the back of the room, then people won't sneak out. They'll be like, oh, it's weird, everybody's looking at me. So I save this to the end. We have to be committed to God. Baruch stayed faithful to his commitment to God, even in uncertain times, right? Even though there was threats that were happening, even though there was a king that didn't want to hear any of this stuff. The idea of being arrested, I mean, all of these things. He knew what God had asked him to do, and he was committed to God. And God was committed to to Baruch. That's important to understand. It's not just about us and our commitment and our faithfulness to God. Friends, God is faithful to those who are faithful to him. God is committed to us in what we are doing. And as, if you read through the rest of the book of Jeremiah, you'll see, you'll get down to like chapter 45, right? And in it, there's a little, little title above it says, Message to Baruch. And in this, basically, Baruch goes into this, I'm going to call it a fit, with God, right? So, the little backstory, right? So we've got the burning of the scrolls. That's kind of the beginning of, of this part of it. Jeremiah is eventually arrested. 
Jerusalem is captured by King Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, Jeremiah is then set free. Both then Jeremiah and Baruch are, are captured again and forced to go to Egypt. And, and Baruch is tired by the time we get to chapter 45. Verse 3, it says, this is Baruch talking. He says, these are bad times for me. He's not like, man, this has been vacation, right? Woo, I'm ready to do some real work now. He's like, these have been bad times for me. It's one thing after another. God is piling on the pain. I'm worn out, and there's no end in sight. I mean, he's like the poster child for positivity at this point. Baruch, he's like, let's, let's do this. Verse 4 says, but God says, look around. What I've built, I'm about to wreck, and what I've planted, I'm about to rip up, and I'm, go and I'm doing it everywhere, all over the earth. So forget about making any big plans for yourself. Things are going to get worse before they get better, but don't worry. I'll keep you alive through the whole business. God doesn't promise him that it's going to be easy or, or, or that it's not going to be painful, that it's not going to be difficult. In fact, God flat out tells him it's going to get worse before it gets better but God says but I've still got you I've got your back I'm protecting you I haven't forgot about you I'm committed to you just like you're committed to me and Baruch had been committed through it all our relationship with God or our lack of relationship with God has a direct impact on our work ethic I don't, know where you, I don't know where you sit when it comes to God. I don't know what your, your belief or your opinion might be about who God is or if there is a God. But friends, I'm going to tell you, we believe there is one God, one true God that created all of this beauty we live in. He created me, my family, my kids, all of us, and that there's purpose behind why we are here. And I'm committed to him because God's committed to me. Because I know that there's more than just what I see. You know, Genesis 2, verse 15, we're at the very beginning of the Bible, right? It says that the Lord put man in the Garden of Eden to work the soil and take care of the garden. God created us for work. There's no question about that. We live in a county, we live in a country where where we strive, we work really hard looking forward to retirement. I work hard today because I know one day I'm going to get to retire and I'm going to do nothing. I'm going to sit, I'm just going to rest, I'm going to fish, I'm going to watch football. I'm probably just going to watch football, honestly. Because I've worked hard, I've worked long, I've put in my time. It's time for me to take a break, right, to stop. Statistics, though, show clearly that when we stop working, we die. It doesn't say that we just get bored. We die. I'm not lying here. So the study showed that I was reading, and this is by, like, the Labor Bureau of something governmentally official through the United States. The, I'm, that's the actual name, I promise it showed that people who retire before 60, right? I mean, just a couple years or whatever, before the age of 60, are 37% 37 more, 37 more likely to die sooner than those who retire at 65. People who retire at 55 says that 89% of those people will die within the next 10 years. So between 55 and 65, if you retire at 55, 89% of those people will be dead by the time they get 65 or before that. Why? Why does this happen, right? Because it's supposed to be a time where we're just kicking back and chilling and relaxing. And the reality is God created us to work. Our bodies were designed to do something, not sit around, not just fade out and be stale. And so whether we're working or volunteering or doing something that we're passionate about whatever it is we can't stop because we're designed to work
because God created us that way. To work our jobs, right? To earn a living. There's nothing wrong with that. You work hard, you provide for your family, you provide for yourself. We can be proud of that. God made Adam and Eve to do that. He told Adam, take care of the land. You even get to name all the animals. Can you imagine how long that took? I'd have been like fish one, two, three, four, and five. We're created to serve him, to work by serving God. We're created to serve our community that we live in, helping people out, right? Doing things for others, keeping people in mind, seeing people that are in need, people that aren't but being a friend, lending a hand, helping someone out of a ditch at two in the morning, as Eric always says. We are designed to work to do things. And our commitment to God, it is directly connected to our work ethic. And our work ethic is directly connected to our integrity. Because that's what it comes down to. When we want to look at our work ethic, it comes down to what our integrity is in the job that we do. Now, I like definitions. When we look at, like, individual words, I'm always like, you know, dictionary.com, right? I'm out looking these things up and everything. My favorite definition, though, is by the Urban Dictionary. That's a fun one, sometimes dangerous. But the Urban Dictionary says this about integrity. It says that it is doing what is right when no one else is looking. Man, that's, that's about the best definition I could find for integrity. It's doing what's right when nobody else is looking. Pastor and author Charles Stanley, he He said this about integrity. He says, the time you spend alone with God will transform your character and increase your devotion. Then your integrity, then your integrity and godly behavior in an unbelieving world will make others long to know the Lord. They're directly connected, friends. And he nailed it on the head when he talks about it. The time that I spend with God, right? Back to that, that first slide that we had where we had rest and work, abiding, spending that time, developing, growing my relationship with God. As we do that, it transforms who I am. And because of that transformation, my integrity then shines brighter than anything in, in, through everything that I do through how I raise my kids or how I treat my wife to the job I perform when I go to work. Integrity is mixed into all of it and all, and it impacts everything around me, everybody around me. And ultimately, friends, it impacts the kingdom of God. Deuteronomy 13.4 says, you must follow the Lord your God, respect him, obey his commands, And do what he tells you. Serve the Lord your God and never leave him. This is our commitment to God. And just like God was faithful to Baruch, he is faithful to us today. We can take that to the bank, friends. We can stand on that in the midst of good and bad. We watch the news and we see all these hurricanes. Puerto Rico is the latest one to just get wiped out because of the latest hurricane and everything. But even in the midst of of destruction and chaos, we can stand on the truth that God is still faithful to his people. We too should be faithful to him. Again, looking at Colossians 3, 23, it says that no matter what your task is, work hard. Always do your best as the Lord's servant, not as man. We've got to be committed to the task that we're doing. We've got to be committed to what our capacity is. And friends, most importantly, we have to be committed to God, to the one true God. And so tonight, friends, I want to encourage you. As we we will go from here in in a little bit, we've got a reflection song that that, that Rochelle is going to do here in just a moment which, in fact, you can just go ahead and come on up. Over this next week, I want to invite you, I want to encourage you to reevaluate what your work ethic is. 
What does it look like? What does it mean to you? To take that word for what it is, or there's two of them there. What does that mean? What does work ethic mean to you? How does that, how does that look? Do you have integrity in your relationship with God? And how you live that out day to day. Is spending time in Scripture important to you, or can you, can you go without doing that? Is spending time praying important to you? Is it essential, or are you okay if you just do it once a week? Where's the integrity in our relationship with God? What is your attitude when difficult times come? How do we respond to that? Friends, all of this ties into what our work ethic is. At our jobs, in our homes, in our relationship with God here tonight. Mr. Lyle is going to come up and close. Thank you, Lord, that you've brought us into your family, that you care for us so much, that you bring us in and you welcome us and you love us and then you put us to work. Thank you that you believe in us like that. And we pray tonight as we go out from here, Lord, we are serving that kind of God, almighty, powerful, awesome, transcendent, majestic, holy, pure, and worthy. We're serving you. And you've said all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me, and I'm giving it to you because you're my followers. Now go. Make disciples. Now go and do my work. So as we go from here, Lord, we're doing it not in our own authority, not in our own power, but in yours, which is unlimited. And we believe that you're going to use us in what you call us to do. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for bringing us in. And thank you for sending us out, bringing us in, sending us out, bringing us in, sending us out until we're in heaven with you. Thank you, God. Amen.